<laughs> um, thanks for coming in today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is one of the um, the gifts of the algorithm is I don't know how um, y- your tweets stumbled in my timeline years ago, but I saw yeah. them and I loved them. And uh, interestingly, I was, and then when I started to hear the music, I'm like, oh, great. I love the music too. Cool. But it was really the algorithm that, that is how we crossed, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, so it's it's nice to, to have you here in the yes. home. Your house is very lovely. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's uh, lots of beautiful sounds have made it what it is today. Mm-hmm. The Okay, the record's coming out. Yes. So when this airs, the record hasn't come out yet. So the record's coming out. Tell, tell, tell us about the process to get here. <clears throat> so um, this is the sophomore LP. It's called DNA Activation. It is a sort of like Ethio jazz, R&B, hip-hop <laughs> fusion. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I actually I thought about the album before I released The Golden Octave. Right. Um, but I was very nervous about doing something that was so uh, cultural, um, just because, like, I'm definitely, I don't speak Tigrinya or Amharic um, very well. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was very nervous to do something that was, like, so cultural and have, you know, judging eyes being like, you're pronouncing this wrong. (laughs) So um, you weren't uncomfortable with wanting to do that. No, no, I wasn't uncomfortable with wanting to do it. I was uh, uncomfortable (laughs) with the thought of doing it and then having people be like... You're so Canadian, you know, so, um, but um, I pushed through and uh, with, uh, after the like good feedback with the Golden Octave, I was like, I think I can do this and right. it'll be okay. And of course, Sun Sun is the best producer ever. So she's made phenomenal instrumentals for me to sing on top of. And we uh, brought some people in to um, perform as well. So we have Karen Ng on the single, who's an amazing saxophone player from Toronto. Um, and uh, she jumped on Sun's Beat and just freestyled, and it came out so lovely. And so uh, we have the first single, which is called Alphabet. So to do, which we're going to premiere, which I'm yeah. glad you brought, to do the Ethiopian hip-hop, R&B, jazzy kind of, thing yeah. right is there's a lot of layers going on there mm-hmm. so if she was uncomfortable if Leilani was, wasn't sure about doing the language when you were presented this as a producer yeah. <laughs> how did you feel about it um well I'm her partner so yeah. I have no choice in the matter <laughs> <laughs> um um no I was I was like I'm really into it because I love Ethiopian uh jazz and Ethiopian music in general and Eritrean music as well. Um, we played a lot at our house and stuff like that. And I'm really into hip hop, so it was really nice, exciting fusion to do. It's nice to to in, try to, in your own way, invent a thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I mean, like, obviously, like, there's a lot of layers to like the album and the fact that I'm both Ethiopian and Eritrean, and and the the conflict there, and the fact that. Um, Sun Sun is Italian and the, like the history and that and I'm just like let's just throw everything in there and try to figure out what happened so it's working out and I imagine you knew a lot about what it could be beforehand but when you finished it I'm sure you learned lots as well yeah, yeah for what, sure. what, 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 is, what is the takeaway from this experience um, it's it's mostly just the connection to history and and to family I didn't know a lot of um, my my background, like I, I would tell people like, yeah, I'm Ethiopian and Eritrean. And that's as far as it would go. Right. But researching this album, I've really learned the different um, tribes and regions that my family is from and like where that connects to in terms of like ancient African um, history and, and things like that. It, it just really opened my eyes to realizing um, the depth of, and the intersectionality of people and like how deep you can really go when you are able to and are privileged enough to know your background because not everybody is like that. Certainly. Are you close to your family? Yeah. Like close enough to, to, <laughs> to, to walk them through this and share this with them? Um, yes, yes, I mean, for that sure. yeah was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, mean I, I come from a very classic Habesha family, Habesha meaning Ethiopian and Eritrean, so I have a very large extended family, so... Um, just like every family, not everything's perfect, but by the ones that are close are close for good reason. And, uh, my mom is very, uh, supportive in this album and helped me with a lot of research and, 
um, uh, pronunciations. And <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm sure I didn't get everything right, but um, yeah. So she, th- my mom has been very supportive. Yes. How, how old were you when you started to take music seriously as a thing that you were going to do? Oh, um, I mean, my mom has footage of me from when I was four, <laughs> singing every Sunday at my mother, at my grandmother's house after mm-hmm. church. We had a thing called the Cousins Band because we had so many children in the house. That was the thing to be like, go out and do music. And so I've always wanted to do music, but um, I think I really didn't start to take it actually serious as a business until 2009. So that's uh, that's, 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Yeah, so 26 is when I decided. I'm 36. 36. But I look like I'm 26 still (laughs) is what I tell people. So... (laughs) So you just yeah, sixteen actually I changed my mind sixteen time is 10 just a con- time's a construct yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. time time's not even real yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you're absolutely correct yeah. the okay so did the people well, I guess starting a little bit older like taking it mm-hmm. seriously older is all right but sometimes families love it when their kids sing when they're little and then when they want to make a living at it and they realize it's hard to make a living at it yeah whereas was everybody still supportive no my mom always said what's your plan B right um, and what was your plan B. I didn't have a plan B. No. I, I was, I, I was like, no, I don't want a plan B because if I have a plan B, I will never focus on the plan A. But in a way, she was 100% right. The plan B could have been music business, just learning administration stuff, things that I now have to learn on my own. That's right. I didn't go to school for it. It's like, I, this is the plan B, this learning to be need. a self-managed artist. <laughs> you need to know these things. So like... Um, yeah, uh, like, I mean, music in general and art isn't really looked as, as a, as a great profession in, in Eritrean Ethiopian culture. It's like, you're either a nurse or, um, you work in like construction or you're doing something with chemistry or something that is like looked upon as like good, a lawyer, like, right. but music and art is like. That's not a job. That's that's something you do on the side. Right. Um, so I, I had to convince my family that I could make this work. <laughs> I'm glad you yeah. did. Yeah. I'm not not yeah, that you mom, needed them, no, but it helps. Yeah, no, it definitely helps to have like your family be um, recognize that what you're doing is not wasting right. your time. Was it the same in your family, son? Um, th- well, they more thought I was going to be like more focused on visual art. And uh, in the last 10 years, like when I met Leilani, I guess, um, is when I started moving more towards uh, music. Right. And they were on board with that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, because you went to school for, to Parsons for visual art. Right. Um, so, but she still does, like she, she did the, um, the cover art for the Golden Octave. That, that's an actual painting that we have in my house. That's it's nice. like gorgeous oil painting and... Um, Oh, I'm going to say gold leaf. gold leaf. Yes. I'm not the visual artist, so I don't know those terms. Um, but yeah, so like we still integrate it um, in the music for sure. Well, it, I suppose that depending on how you approach it, when if if it's just a holistic approach to expression, yeah, then it should and can include everything, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And what it means to be an artist today is really different, especially if you're self-managed because you're yeah. probably not you don't have a lot of outside voices telling you what to do. Yeah, exactly. Which is a double-edged sword, because sometimes you can get yes. so fucking far down the rabbit hole. Yep. <laughs> right? Yep, was exactly. This in, how close was this to not being the thing you did? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, how close can you get? It's like, <laughs> I mean, I... I, I I sent that that I sent Elsa bed at like midnight, I think, because we were in the studio just right. constantly listening and me being like, I don't know if I should even do this or if I should, um, you know, tone it down or if I should take out the parts where I'm singing it in Amharic, even though it's just like two three words. It's like there there is all this fear that is constantly there, but then it's also like. Well, if I don't do it, I will regret it. So it's either I regret it because I didn't do it, or I am upset because other people didn't like it. And like, I don't, I don't think I care about that part so much. It would, I, the part that would really bug me is that I didn't do something. So. And of all the people I've interviewed over the years, the very few of them regret putting something out. Yes. But they yeah. all regret not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. As long as it's not hurting people. <laughs> yeah. You know, exactly. for the most part, anyway. Yeah. So okay, we're gonna play that song, and then you also brought a list of music. Um, 
the independent thing. Tell me about what, what that brings to your experience. Yeah. As an artist, trying to think <laughs> about all these things. But also, the, yeah. and I, what I'm really curious about is the freedoms, because we have a lot of people who want to be in this business, and that they overthink what they think they need. Yeah. You know, what does it bring to you? Um, it brings me understanding of uh, how much work goes into every little thing that people take advantage of. It's like, just like, oh, it's a single. It's like, oh. It's like, uh, that actually took a lot of work. There's <laughs> many steps to release that single to do it. So, like, it's actually brought me a lot of uh, knowledge um, in terms of just how to be a better artist, how to be a better person, how to organize my life in general. Um, but it's also shown me that, like, it's it's really, really hard being an independent artist. And I've, I've gotten to this point where... Um, People are like, oh, you've been doing it for so long and you do it so well. You don't need any help. It's like, ah, should I have been doing it bad this whole time? Because maybe if I was doing it wrong, then people would be like, let me help you. You right. poor girl. Let me help, <laughs> you know. But now they're like, you're strong. You could do it. It's like, yeah, I can totally. But I'd really like some help. I'd really like that extra step because you really you can't do everything yourself. But isn't you know? community important to you? Yeah, right? of course. And people seem to forget that communities. Yeah. You know, we had it was against me was in here and Laura Jane said, do it yourself doesn't mean do it alone. Yeah, exactly. And I think actually um, something that I saw uh, Rosina from Lao, I don't know if you know Lao, they're like amazing mm -hmm. electronic group from Toronto. But um, Rosina had posted something on Facebook that was um, instead of DUI, it was uh, DUT. So do it together. And her whole aspect is like, we don't do it ourselves. There's always community helping. And I mean, within the past 10 years of us being in, a, myself and Sunsun, um, being a part of 88 Days, which was the collective that we had co-founded, that was really what it was, was community. It was us putting things together, having that platform, having people, you know, really push it. But it only goes so far because it's like, all of that community doesn't mean that somebody in that community is a music journalist or somebody in that community knows really well about grants. So like mm -hmm. there, you always need to know somebody else outside. Um, so it, it, like we reached a point where it was like, we need to expand what we're doing because although this is fantastic, we're like, um, you know, within this group and we're really like working with each other, we've hit this wall where it's like, what else can we do for each other? There's nothing else. So right. we need to move, keep moving forward. And that's what I've learned about an ind independent artist is that you always have to keep moving. You stop and it's done. So it's, it's always work. <laughs> never, never play until somebody decides to be like, here's a million dollars. Do you notice when you did that, was it that list, you listed the 30 artists that people should pay attention to? Yeah. How much that resonated? Yeah. You know, because we all like stuff. Yeah. But that seemed to carry a different kind of weight in the community. Why do you think that is? Well, because everybody's sick and tired of pretending there's no female <laughs> musicians in the Toronto <laughs> hip-hop scene. Um, I think that, and I think, I mean, like, when I had posted that, I think it was, like, 2016 or 2017, like, yeah. the zeitgeist of the world was women empowerment. Yeah. So that's and what every... Toronto. Yes. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's what everybody was focused on. So I just happened to tap into something that everybody was already um, very interested in knowing about. But even still, I even after that, I'm like, there's still a lot more. I did not put all the people. And I always think about, like, I'm going to post another list, but I'm like, this is work though. Like people get paid for this. People get like, this is a pitch. This is the actual, this is a write-up. This is something that can be somewhere. Yeah. But I'm not necessarily always thinking like, I don't want to do it because I want to get paid. It's like, but I want people who are in these positions to actually be doing the work that they're supposed to be doing, like research it. It's there. If I right. can find it and I'm not a music journalist, you can find it, you know? So, um, it's like, it's frustrating. Cause it's like, I want to be able to be like, here's everything. But I'm also like, Hey, like I shouldn't have to tell you everything because then right. the, where you're getting this from is blocked out. You're like, I discovered this thing, which is something that we found all the time. All yeah. the time, it's like we work with female musicians, and then 
will push it to like music journalists or whatever and they'll kind of ignore it for a while and then something will pop off with them and they'll be like, oh man, I discovered this female right. rapper. And it's like, I've actually been emailing you for five years. I don't want to do that work and anymore. And also, I suspect the other part of it is that you have to help them, not you, but we, yeah. the you, we, we have to help them build the mechanisms by which they can find this without you. Yes, exactly. Right, which is the pathway to, yeah. to discovering music. Because, you know, Toronto's got basically five publicists. Yes. Right? And yeah. if you don't get pitched through those five publicists, it's hours and hours to find yes. that other person. If I put on, I would say, and I because I've done this, about 80% of the rap that comes out of Atlanta, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Does Toronto have a thing? Um... I mean, there is a sound that is coming out that is the same. And Un- they say the same things? Yeah. <laughs> similar. Yeah, topics. similar. Similar yeah, music I mean, videos. It, yeah, similar music videos, similar topics. But that's if you're just looking at the thing that, um, which is what they're doing, is they're t- tapping into what's the in. So yeah. that's what people are doing now. But um, I don't think the women are sounding the same. That's what I'm wondering. So these artists yeah. that you had mentioned, and, and you know, we just had a volume ID in here today. And oh, yeah, we she's had, awesome. She's awesome, right? Yeah. And uh, sh- it's more throwback yeah. than what I hear today. Yeah. So is there a, is there a, are there themes that are consistent with some of these people that you're, that you're supporting your fans of? Um, some of the, th- the themes, I guess, are a queer empowerment, um, yeah, mostly queer love, queer, love, yeah. queer empowerment. Um, I guess that would be the number one theme with the people that we're working with right now. Um, like one of our artists is named Jasmine. Um, we've been working with her for almost 10 years. Um, she started off as just in a band called um, Neverland Gang. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they sort of broke up and she started her own thing, which is now called No Squad in the Wild. And we helped release her album and like everybody who heard it was like, yeah, she's like the female version of Drake. (laughs) It's just like, yeah, but she's what and what that means is that she's rapping about love. Right. So she's she's rapping about love, but she's also pretty hardcore and like but when it comes to people supporting um, Yasmin, I feel like there's this block of like. Well, it's not the ideal female rapper, so it's not the like super femme rapper, so we're not going to get behind this. Right. So there's still that weird stigma on like what women can look like in the music industry and but like guys what's... can look like whatever they yeah. want, you know what I mean? Like yeah, guys right. can be anything, Definitely. anything they want, but a female in hip hop has to be a very specific look in order to get past. Who's the look? What's the look? I mean, no diss to Cardi because she's awesome, yeah. but the look is Cardi. It's yeah. it's Bia. It's uh, China. It's um, it's a thing. Nicki yeah, Minaj. Yeah. Like it's you know, thing. Yeah. yeah. It's the like it's the weaves. It's the you know the nails. The like no, that's an aver- which is an aesthetic, and that's totally cool. And it's for very that. American. Yeah. It's a very American aesthetic, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, but but I definitely see the some Canadian and specifically Toronto um, rappers, female who. When I first saw them about f- five years ago, they weren't um, projecting as this ultra femme, and right. now they are because right. I guess they see it and they're like, "This is the way that I can I can still be hardcore and be from like Jane and Finch or whatever, but I have to be this femme on the outside in order for people to accept me," which I think is kind of whack. But also, like, do you if you think that's going to help, then do you? That's an interesting line to walk, though, isn't it? Yeah. Because, and that's a complicated line yeah. to walk. Because I wonder, and not even about subject matter. It's always, a, it, to me, I've always wondered when artists, what an artist needs to do, like, what do you want out of this? And, yeah, it's always shitty if you have to change who you are to be famous. Yeah. But if you want fame and you know that this is who the audience, who people are, like, you can be you. And you can be a great artist and a very well-received artist. Yeah. But fame was not promised to you. Yeah. So if you want fame, then yeah. this is what has to happen. Yeah. And then, so that, I always wonder what the struggle is inside your head when you're like, fuck, that check would be great. Yeah. Or that check would be great. Yeah. I'm definitely the type of person who I don't want to necessarily be famous. I just want to be able to have a sustainable life and be able to travel 
and eat good food and <laughs> be like, I'm happy with my life. I have a nice home. I'm comfortable. I can help, you know, um, people with platforms that they might not be able to, yeah. you know, help for themselves. And that's about it. Like, I've been given opportunities where um, I can't say who, but somebody approached me to license one of my songs and they're extremely famous. <laughs> I was like, I had a moment where I was like, I don't agree with a lot of the things that they showcase or they promote as as a person, as a human. So were they, is it, were they homophobic publicly? No. No. No, <laughs> <laughs> no they're not homophobic. Right. I just don't I just they're just not my type of person. So right. it's like, uh But they liked something you did and they yeah, wanted they to Yeah, they loved it. they loved a track <laughs> and they wanted to license it for a product of theirs. And I had this thought of like if I do this, I'm I'm gonna blow up. Yeah. Because they have a huge following and whatever they play, those people will jump on it. Right. And I, I really had to like I talked to Sun and I was like, I don't think I can do this. I have to say no because I don't want that type of attention on me. And she was like, You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, when it happens, it's gonna happen. If it if it's gonna happen, it'll happen. And if it's meant to happen, it'll happen again at the right circumstance. So um, I said no to that. I always think about it, though. Do you say no via email? or Yeah, via email. What was the before I hit send? What was that like? Uh, I was, like, shaking. <laughs> I was physically shaking because first I couldn't believe that this person had written me and said that they really liked the song right. to begin with because I was like... That means if if you've heard my music, then... Was it Donald Trump? No. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I wouldn't be like, I don't care about the NDA that I signed. I'm about to talk about this. But, like, you know, so yeah. it wasn't him. Close, though. Oh, really? But so... Oh, but fucking so, gnarly. So, but... So, in yeah. a way, in a sense, it was difficult, but it yeah. wasn't difficult. Cause yeah. You knew. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't difficult because I, I think I have some pretty strong morals, but it was difficult because... I've always wanted to be Janet Jackson. Yeah. So like I'm like Well we all want to be Janet. Yeah, right? So it's like this is pretty close. <laughs> this could take me pretty close. But then I was like, but also is this what I really want? Do you Which regret you, it? No. No, but you think about it. I do think about it just because I think about how far along would I be if if right. I had done this. Right. Um, but I also remind myself that maybe it would maybe I would have gone like up and then boo back down. <laughs> which, like, which is the traditional yeah. trajectory, right? Yeah. For that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Which so I was just like, maybe this is gonna be for the best. And so I hope that this Well, as we've learned for the best. <laughs> life is about choices. Yes. Yes. Right? And yep. and uh, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, nothing is supposed to be easy. Let's talk about some what like what do you want to say is the thing that I find uh, uh, it's one of the reasons I, I liked when I, when I saw you online. Mm-hmm. So I liked what you said. Yeah. And I wondered how those are not always easy things to put into records, yeah. right? Especially if you want to be Janet Jackson. Yeah. Because the truth is about Janet, as amazing as she is, yeah. no one's going to dissect Janet Jackson's yeah. lyrics for the most part and yeah. go, world beater. But yeah. you can look at Janet's presence in the era and go, okay, that was enough. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But in this era, that's not enough anymore. Yeah, exactly. So what did you want to say when you set out to do this record? Understanding that you had traditional sounds and other things. Um, I think with this record, it's more about um, just really – tapping into yourself and, and, and your higher being and your ancestry, whether that mean um, your physical, like, family that has, you know, passed or whatever, or as in past lives, yeah. uh, reincarnation. But really this album is to just to tap into people's uh, inner truth. The whole point of DNA activation is to activate the part of yourself that allows you to remember who you truly are. Um, I mean, which could be like super hippie to say yeah. that, but like it's what I believe in, and like, I really do believe that music sonically does um, connect people, and and so that's what I aim to do with this album. Do you ever think you were a white man in a past life? Um, not a white man, no. a Russian woman. A Russian woman. Yeah. Okay. For what, sure. What was that like? Uh. <sighs> Probably very similar to this life, 
filled with a lot of, um, I want to say fame and, and hate at the same time. I know exactly who I was in my past life. So, Like you know her name? Yeah. What was her name? <laughs> Helena, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. That's who you were? Yeah, I, which... I mean, if you're into occult stuff, you might be like, you're crazy. No, you're crazy. Like, like, fuck, it's but, your past life. I don't judge anybody yeah. in their past life. I only, only judge them on this life. these lives. And only from like 20 years old and on. Yeah. You know, from past life to 20, I don't really give a fuck what yeah. you did. You know? um, yeah, but I was, I w- it's a very interesting thing because I actually knew absolutely nothing about Helena Blavatsky ever at all. I've never even heard about her. And um, son actually introduced me to... Uh, I don't know what to call him, like a teacher. I'd just say a magical guy. Yeah, a magical <laughs> like person. A, but is he like a medium? He's a, a person who can like yes. talk to spirits, I okay, guess. Cool. Yeah, so a medium, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fuck, the one world, one life spirits are enough yeah. to carry. To open the door to previous spirits, that's a lot of stuff to carry, isn't it? Yes, yes. he was a very intense person. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> very, very intense. Um, but he, um, I... <laughs> Got introduced to him in Jamaica when we mm-hmm. when we went one year, and um, he told me a lot of really weird things that there'd be no way for him to know. Literally, like it's just like, oh, you go to Jamaica and you meet some Jamaican guy on the beach, and then he tells you your whole life, and you're like, well, I cannot deny that something is happening <laughs> because there's no way you could have known any of this because I don't know you and you don't know me. Um, Was that unsettling for you? Yes, and exciting. Yeah. I have this thing where I I really love magic, but as soon as the truth, like, as soon as it's, like, right in front of my face, I cry because it's so overwhelming. But not in this cry of, like, I'm scared, but in this way of, like, I am so relieved that that I was correct yeah. in whatever I was thinking, that it's right here. So with, with him, his name's Abka. With Abka, I was, like, always would cry, and he'd be like, you need to... <laughs> Reel it in. Like, <laughs> stop <this>. crying. <laughs> but anyways, he told us. He told me to do this thing and uh, how to figure out my past life. And I did, and I had a dream, and I um, some names came to me, and I, I Googled it, and I searched, and a lot of the things um, in her biography and, and just, like, different stories about her are very similar to things that have happened in my life in this realm so unassisted like no ayahuasca none of that just straight up sober into it completely it was actually it was like you we couldn't do in order to do this uh, we weren't allowed to smoke weed drink alcohol have sex kiss like nothing Uh, we weren't allowed to eat certain foods or until a certain time we fasted for three days yeah we fasted for three days um said certain prayers at certain times truth isn't free Yes. Truth no, it definitely so was it not. Got something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's play some songs. Yeah. Um, okay. So you, you you had sent a list over, and they're wonderful songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah, she, son's laughing at me because she hates Paul Simon. <laughs> Why do you hate Paul Simon? <laughs> she doesn't like that style of folk music. Okay. Yeah. Well, I should I shouldn't speak yeah, for you. True. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean. I I really love um, the sound of silence. I love the um, their harmony, the the original, mm-hmm. not when Paul Simon was being petty and recorded it by himself. So like when they were Simon and Garfunkel, and uh, the harmonies were amazing. I grew up listening to Paul Simon's um, Graceland. I know that's not on that album, but um, this is a great he just album. yeah, it's a fantastic album. Um, a lot of the songs were very haunting for me. Um, but I just remember it so clearly in my house, um, playing all the time. So it really connected with me. Um, and I mean, I love folk music. I love Paul Simon's voice. I love the writing style of folk music. I love the storytelling. Um, and and that's why I picked the songs because that's that's another dream is like to do a folk album, one day. Yeah. Get ready to produce that. Yeah, <laughs> like pick up a guitar okay. and learn <laughs> how to strum. Let's play Simon and Garfunkel on the Strombo Show. It's a Strombo show on CBC Music, Simon and Garfunkel, Sounds of Silence, for um, which profit as you record as. Um, all right, what's next? What do you want to play next? Um, let's go with, since we're doing the folk, let's go with Tracy Chapman, Fast Car. Um, and again, like that's my dream is to 
get on an album with Tracy Chapman. That would be like so amazing. How old would you have been when that record came out? Uh, when did that come out? 80s? Yeah. 80s something? Late 80s, late 80s, yeah. Well, I was born 82, okay, so, so you were young. maybe like five, six. Do, I don't, <laughs> do you remember how big that track was? I mean, it was yes. enormous. A hit. That yeah. was a huge hit. Yeah. Years yeah. after too. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the great it's one of the great songs. Yeah. And it's, it's crushing. Yeah, the, it, that entire her entire debut album was like something that was just I think took the world by storm and still does because I, I was even researching her like how many albums has she come out after that? And I'm like, Oh my god, she said like ten <laughs> or something, but like that's that's the one that I know. Yeah. Like front to back, no problem. I can sing any song. Um it just really was like so real and again haunting and intense but in a really great way. I will play that too. Yeah. It's such a great track. The Strombosch on CBC Music is Tracy Chapman. Um, Witch Prophet uh, Leilani is here and son, 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 the two sons. Um, so what, what should we play next? Um, next we're going to go with uh, The Satisfaction Queens. So um, The Satisfaction uh, I met them in 2008 via MySpace. It, like, really random documentary was playing. I saw them for maybe two seconds in the documentary. Just thought they looked really cool. Reached out to them, figured out they were musicians, loved their music. Um, then I fast forward, I brought them to Toronto in 2011 to play the 88 Days two-year anniversary. And from then, they joined the collective um, we released songs on our mixtapes, and then they had their album that got picked up by Sub Pop, and they're like, now we need to do a music video. Like, this is real. And so uh, Sun Sun and I flew to New York, and um, we did this music video, which is like, it was so amazing. It was done within a day, and Dream Hampton was the um, director. And at that point, moment I had no idea who Dream Hampton was. I was just like, yeah, such a nice lady, whatever. <laughs> like, no big deal. By the end of the shoot, I was like, let me just Google and see who she is. Like, what has she done or whatever. And then when I realized, like, everything that she's done, I, I was so nervous around her <laughs> so like for the rest of the night I was like trying to be super cool and calm and being like I can't believe like she was Biggie Smalls best friend like yeah. she's like this is so weird she wrote Jay-Z's uh, like autobiography like there's like so much history like so much hip-hop history in her mind you know so um it was really intense but like I'm so grateful because after that video we ended up being uh, becoming really close friends with That's her great. so she's a fantastic fantastic person and we have to get her on the show yeah man she's oh my god she's yeah. so smart and she's in new york now um detroit, detroit yeah okay, cool. right. yeah what do you want to play next um i guess uh you know what i don't know how to say her whole name okay but um it's Mariam. so she is a nun from ethiopia um who plays classical piano and um, I stumbled upon her song, The Homeless Wanderer, and just completely fell in love. I think the first time we both broke into tears, yeah, like listening to it, and we were just like, this is amazing. I can't believe this. Um, and her story is that she was like, grew up very wealthy, moved uh, around to Europe, um, learned piano, came back to Ethiopia, um, and then was sort of... Uh, became a prisoner of war um, and then s escaped again. And so, like, this just, like, this complete story of, like, riches to rags to becoming a nun to getting so sick because she was not able to let her music out because there was nothing in the monastery to going back home and continuing her music to releasing albums. And so it was just, like... When I found out about her, I was like, this is amazing, especially because in, in my culture, there's so, such like, music is bad. So like, <laughs> the fact that this nun was doing music, she found a loophole. She was doing religious music. Right. So um, That's always the loophole. Yes, isn't it is. it? It's the greatest it loophole ever. <laughs> it is. So um, yeah, so uh, it's again, Mariam, um, the homeless wanderer. All right, let's play that.
It's a strong show on CBC Music. That is the Homeless Wonder, the name of the song. You know, you'd mentioned MySpace. I am convinced if they relaunch MySpace with the original interface, yeah, it would rock it to number one again because it was the greatest music website ever. Yeah. I always tell Bandcamp when I tweet to them, <laughs> like, <laughs> make your page MySpace. Yeah. It was Make the best. People be able to add friends and comment. Same thing. It's literally it, what it is. Change it's, the yeah, background. That's it. Yeah. Do what we want. Yep. Like, All that stuff. Yeah. MySpace it, was amazing. The amount of people I met uh, through there was like incredible. Bands that used to come to Toronto would just look at Toronto, yeah. would reach out to me going, hey, we're going to be in, in, in town. Mostly punk and metal bands. Because, yeah. you know, like what you're going, it was all independent, right? Yeah. And Facebook doesn't do that. Twitter's fucking void now. Yeah. Instagram is now a fashion show. Yeah. So that's the brand I think yeah. that, that came back. I mean, your uh, careers are built on MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love MySpace. I think it's still around. It like, is, but they've changed, they changed it. it. Oh, yeah. okay. Like yeah. Timberlake bought it, I think, right? Uh, Eventually. And okay. now it, there's no messaging. It's more like allmusic.com in a way. Oh. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, no, no. They should have just kept it the way it was. It really did. It, it worked so well. So well. Yeah. Tom's got to buy it back. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> thanks for coming in today. Yeah, thanks for I having me. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, both of you. Yeah, thank you. Nope. Oh, let me stop this here.